it's like a, um, it's like, it's like letting, when you let, you fill up your bath and you have a bath and you pull the plug out, when the water comes down, it, it kind of just goes down a bit slower, a bit slower, a bit slower, a bit slower, but when it gets to that last little bit, it kind of just goes quick. Well, I think we're in the, of the times that it's going quick. <laughs> the days are going quick. I think Jesus is going to be coming back soon mm -hmm. because we're in that little bit that just goes down the drain and disappears quickly. Over the 6,000 years, it slowly resided, but now we're, I don't know whereabouts, that little last bit of water has got to go. I don't know where it's at, but we're close to it. Praise God. So, last week, what's shocking? Um, last week it was the, the, a few different things last week but the three main points were or three good points were the women were allowed to go on the other side of the wall and uh, and um, through the sheep coming down the God gave Peter the vision of the sheep coming down through that sheep with unclean animals like cows and, and pigs Put it, the hooves, I mean, not put it, hooves, animals came down on that sheep, and uh, out of that came the, bat, the the falling of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles, because it came on the day of Pentecost, but this is now to the Gentile people, the falling of the Holy Spirit, and the water baptism, if they, if they, Peter said, well, if they're good enough to receive the Spirit, why can't they be water baptized? So also, the water baptism came through that vision that God had given Peter on that sheet. And the number one was listening to the voices that surround us instead of listening to the voice of God because God told Peter to kill and eat through that sheet, eat at the tables of the Gentiles, but um, he listened to the voices of men and he walked away from what God had told him and um, began to leave the Gentiles alone and that's when God brought Paul along listen to man and separated and separated himself away from the Gentiles if we are not prepared to go all the way with God he will bring someone else along who will so that was another thing that came out of last week if you're not prepared to go all the way with God like Peter God brought Paul along to preach gospel to the Gentiles because Peter listened to man, listened to the outside voices, they come along so he separated himself from them, then God brought Paul along and Paul rebuked him in Galatians and then, um, and then uh, Paul was given the ministry to run with um, the Gentiles Peter listened to man so God brought Paul along so praise God, so that was last week it was a bit in last week, but it was good. Praise the Lord. And this week is um, in Luke. I'll be starting in Luke. Chapter 3, verse 21. When all the people were baptised, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptised. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. So Father, I thank you for your word, Almighty God, and pray for revelation of your word, Father. We need revelation of your word, Almighty God. It's through revelation, Lord, that it becomes alive and living, Father. Lord, and we need it to be alive and living inside of us, Lord, around us. Just consume our whole lives, Almighty God, as a living word, Father, and not just as a word, Almighty God, or as a Bible, Father, or as a book, Lord, but it's through revelation that consumes our life, Almighty God, as the living word of God, Lord, that through revelation it'd be alive in us, Almighty God. We praise you and honour you, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So, when all the people were baptised, it came to pass that Jesus was also, Jesus also was baptised, and while he prayed, 
the heaven was open. So he got water baptised, and when he got come, I, I suppose when he come up out of the water, I know I got baptised in the Darling River out at Burke in the Darling River, and um, it was like the bloke, Pastor George Mann and Glen Reed, they water baptised me, and, and it was like we couldn't even stand on our feet. The, the spirit come down and was that heavy upon us that both the pastors that, that baptised me, they couldn't stand up and, and we were all, the three of us were floating around in the river because we couldn't get back on our feet because of the anointing that was there. And then when I got the photos developed, you could see this like white thing coming down from heaven, like a, a vacuum coming down from heaven, like a, not a vacuum, but a, a white funnel thing coming down from heaven on, on top of us and, and you know that was happening on top of us praise God and, uh, and we were praying and whatever we couldn't get on our feet and laughing and couldn't stand up in the water like we were trying to get on our feet in the water but it, it just wasn't happening because the spirit of God was upon us and uh, so we were praying and that and, and I, can just, I, just, I just know the amazing time that that was that it was just it was just amazing and uh, yeah, like, and it just felt different for days and days after that. And just, I felt that I was expecting that tattoo to go on that, but that it never happened like that. Some people, it does happen. I've heard of that revival over in uh, Pensacola or somewhere over there that they were baptized, water baptizing people, and they'd bring them up out of the water, and they'd tap people with tattoos, and tattoos would be gone, and uh, uh, Toronto. In uh, Canada or Pensacola, or just revivals that were taking place over there. So I expected it to happen with my water baptism, but it never. And I've still got them today. But from that moment, I said, "They're just the scars of the past. They're not tattoos anymore. The scars of the past. That's the scars of how the heart was back in them days, back in that day, full of hurt and, and wanted to hurt itself. You know, like wanted to hurt itself even more. But anyway." This is, this is the amazing bit in verse 22. And when the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove, that really just, that, that just spoke to me. That Just that little bit that the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form. Like we've got a picture of, of the Son of God or, or the Word of God in a bodily form in Jesus Christ. We've got that. Well, God says, those who worship me, I am spirit. And those who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. So God says, I'm spirit. I'm not a bodily form, but I'm spirit. But he said, a bodily form is my word. My word is a substance. It's a bodily form. So he set it down here in the form of Jesus Christ. And then to give us a bodily form or a bodily picture, I didn't realise this until I read this the other day, we always associate the dove with the Holy Spirit, but actually that is a bodily form that God has given the Holy Spirit. It's, 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 so that, it's so that when we see the dove, we can see the bodily form of the Holy Spirit. We can have glimpses of the Holy Spirit as a body, as, as, as sub, a substance. It's, it's something here on the earth that God's given us a substance so that we can relate to the Holy Spirit with that we can, that it's, in, in, if you can see, he wants us to believe without a substance in him. But he, he's given us a substance to believe in his word and he's given us a substance to believe in the Holy Spirit in bodily form. He showed us a white dove as the Holy Spirit. And that really just, oh, just really exploded me because... That, it, when I go to Israel, there's only two places I want to go and visit in Israel. One is I want to go to Hezekiah's Tunnel. I want to walk through Hezekiah's Tunnel. It hasn't got a lot of water flowing through it, but it's got a little bit of water to this day. Water still flows through Hezekiah's Tunnel, if you don't know Hezekiah's Tunnel. Hezekiah, when the, when the people of Jerusalem, they would come go out to there. They had the water supply was out deep in the Kidron Valley and they'd have to walk down in the Kidron Valley, collect their water and go back into Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem, go back in there. But when they went down in the valley, they would come under attack of the enemy. Their enemies, because they would be on the mountain beside the valley where the, Kidron, where the water supply was, they would come under attack. 
So what Hezekiah done, King Hezekiah, he made a tunnel. This is in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 20. He made a tunnel. One th this is it because I had to do a study on it to find this out. 1,777 feet long, Hezekiah and his men dug a hole. This is 800 years prior to Jesus. So 2,800 years ago, with the tools that they had back then, he dug a tunnel through solid rock. 1,777 feet long, hewn through solid rock, and he took it in to Jerusalem, and he made a pool at the end of it. And we know that pool today, and back in Jesus' and Bible time, as the pool of Siloam. And because of that thorough job that Hezekiah had done, Jesus said to the blind men when he spat on the ground and rubbed mud in his eyes, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man went in there and washed the mud off his eyes <coughs> and his blind eyes were opened because of the good work that Hezekiah had done back then. So that's a whole different story, but that's one place that I want to go and visit. When I go, I want to go through his tunnel and I want to walk the, the length of his tunnel, 1,000, it's not far, it's not even 500 metres. I want to walk through that into, into Jerusalem. That's one thing. And the second thing is I want to go to this place. I want to go to where Jesus was water baptised because God the Father was there. God said he was there because he was spirit, but he couldn't be seen in a bodily form in this place. But by faith, we have to believe that he was there because God said, this is my own son and him I am well pleased. So God was there and Jesus was there. The word of God was there because he was there in bodily form. He got water baptised. And the dove descended in bodily form, the Holy Spirit, down from heaven and came down and rested on the, on the shoulder of Jesus. The Father, Son and the Holy Spirit were there in the place of his water baptism, being here on the earth in one spot. They were right there and I thought, man, I want to go and visit this because if I go and visit there, I'll know that it's the right spot because, you know, when you get goosebumps or you feel them things or not, I know that by that I'll get this feeling as I walk through the tunnel because I have a revelation of that and I have this revelation that this spot where Jesus was water baptised was where the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit were there in that spot in one time together because God spoke, this is my Son, in, in spirit, Jesus was there, the word of God was there in the form of Jesus in bodily form and now the Holy Spirit was there, came down. Jesus isn't in the earth today. Where did he go? He ascended on high. He's not, there's not very often the three of them are in one spot at one time. I think there's only two times in the Bible that I've found but I'm not quite sure. I know definitely this is one spot in the Bible that I've found that the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit were there at the one spot at the same time. The Godhead, well, we know Jesus is God and Jesus is the Holy Spirit, so like that we can know that, but the Godhead was actually there in one spot and this spot would be one of the spots that when I'd want to go and visit in uh, Israel when I go. They're the only two, anything else I can go on, any other tour guide, but I 100%, I'd never want to go there and not go to them two places for them two reasons. Amen. So, uh, God is spirit. That's John 4, 24. I said that. The word became flesh, John 1, 14. And the Holy Spirit was in bodily form as the dove. That's what I just read in 3, 22. So that's scripture confirmation that God is spirit. The word became flesh, bodily form, and the Holy Spirit became bodily form in the form of a dove. Praise God. But this is this is this is what I this is what I want to what I want to get. God's word, God's voice, what God said. You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Because this is what we've been concentrating on over the last couple of weeks was about this is about been about the voice of God. That God knows our voice. It's about our voice and God's so He knows our voice. He doesn't only hear the words of every person praying to him, but he hears individually every single voice of someone that's praying to him, and that's <laughs> I've only just I want to point this out, that's a spot 
where God's voice was. When I get into this later on and show you the power of that voice, how magnificent it would have been there for every person because Jesus went there and all the people got baptised, remember? It wasn't just Jesus and John the Baptist. All the people would have been there and all the people that were there that day would have heard God say, this is my own beloved son. This audible voice, this voice came from heaven like a like a rolling thunder or a or a um oh, I've got the slide up there. Uh, it's a, uh, I forget. But anyway, like a rolling thunder. This voice we know what it's like you can hear thunder thirty kilometers away. You can hear it rolling faintly. You can still hear it, but but imagine this God was there right there at that spot when they got water baptized and like that rolling thunder this voice said this is my own beloved son in him I am well pleased it's amazing go back to uh, uh, 39 of Luke 2 so when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord they returned to Galilee to their own city Nazareth and the child grew and became strong in spirit filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him so Jesus grew he had to grow like us exactly how what did he, he didn't grow in the flesh it didn't say that he grew in spirit Jesus had to grow in spirit too we have to grow in spirit we 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 get born again we, we got all this knowledge or whatever from the world but that's nothing because we've got to learn this We've got, like Lily was saying in communion, that, that you've got to learn to discern. It just doesn't happen. Like Jesus was 12 year old and he was in the temple teaching people. At 12 year old, where were you at in the church at 12 year old? I wasn't even in the church. I'd probably gone to my first church at Catholic High School because of high school and seen me a big M in the coloured beer and windows, the coloured glass and the windows was probably one of my first encounters with God I'd ever had. That's probably 12 or 13 around that age. I don't know how old. But that, that's where I was at in God. But Jesus is sitting in the temple teaching men that knew it all. But he still, from there, he still had to grow in his spirit. What it, what it says to me is I don't care where you're at today, you still need to grow in your spirit. If Jesus needed, he was God, he was the word of God. All things were created through him and because of him. And if he needed to grow in his spirit, so do we. We need to grow. We can't stay at the same place. We need to be changing daily, over and over and over. And the only way we can change is by what? By pruning. By God doing the pruning, which we were talking about last month. About being pruned. We have to change through the pruning. We need the pruning. But anyway, Jesus had to grow in spirit. Listen, this, I've got another thing here I want to share. Filled with wisdom, so he grew in spirit. He had the wisdom. He was filled with wisdom. But listen to this bit. This is something that's thrown me right off. No, it hasn't. And the grace of God was upon him. Why would the grace of God have to be upon Jesus. There was neither no sin nor deceit found in his mouth. If we're saying, if man says that the grace of God is to cover a multitude of sin, why did the grace of God have to be on Jesus? I think the grace of God has got a different reason than what we give credit for it. If the grace of God had to be in someone that grew in spirit and grew in wisdom, and the grace of God had to be on top of him. What's it for? There was no sin involved in it. There was no sin. This is what I mean. This one just, Lord, I need to do a study on this somehow, God. Why would the grace of God be on Jesus? It's not for the grace of God is on us so we can do what we want to do. And, oh, no, I won't do that because the grace of God. No, the grace of God is for you to grow in spirit. To grow inside of yourself grow and find out who you are. Know who you are in God. 
It's not to say go and do whatever you want to do. Tell a, tell a lie because God will cover that. That's not what the grace of God is for. If the grace of God was on Jesus, what was it actually for? What is the grace of God actually for? Jesus had no sin. That's the thing that hit me in that one. Anyway, Exodus 15. Just threw them in to start. I always start. Verse 25, so, so he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. When, when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There, there he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and said, If you diligently hear the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians for I am the Lord who heals you. <laughs> Can you start to see this voice was there at Jesus' water baptism and more than one person got water baptised that day or more than one person was there because God said there was a lot of other people there and the voice of God the voice of God was there. And what did the word of God or the voice of God say? This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him. This is, this is, I'll give you a bit of a around it. So what's happened to you? The, Moses and the people and they've gone through the desert and they've gone three days without water and they're thirsty and all that and they've gone and they've complained and winched to Moses and said, what are we going to do? What's God setting us up here for? Now? What are you making us fail out here in the desert? What he's brought it out here? Whatever. Whatever they were winching and whining about. And, and Moses went to God and called out to God and well, even when they drink the water it was bitter. The water was bitter and God said to Moses, okay Moses I want you to just you know, like, I'm just going to send a sheet down from heaven with cows and pigs on it and I'm going to make the Gentiles get water baptised and baptised with the Holy Spirit through that. God said to Moses, go and throw a stick, go and throw a tree into the water, Moses, and then tell them to have a drink. So they go, Moses throws the stick into the river and the water then becomes sweet. It becomes sweet. It was bitter, but it becomes sweet. So he cried out to the Lord, this is Moses crying out, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Then he made a statue and an ordinance of, for them, and, he, and, and there he tested them. So he cried out to God last week, what was the tree, man? God, what's the tree? Get the tree, what was the, what was the, what's the water? Well, I was walking in life, mate, and my water was bitter. But when the tree was thrown into the water, the water made sweet. Who's the, who's the tree? When Jesus came into me, the king of all trees, the tree of Lebanon, when he came into me, he made the spirit inside of me sweet. The water inside of me sweet. It was bitter. It was angry and bitter and, and torn and just hatred, rejected. But when the tree came into the spirit of me, it made it sweet. This is what I just got out of this quickly as I was looking at it. So he's made a change in my life. There he made a statue and an ordinance to them. And there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, so diligently, I did look that up. Where is it? If diligently in a way that shows care and consciousness of in one's work or duties, and he pay attention to take notice. This is what I pray. If you show care and cons consciousness to pay, to and pay attention to taking notice of God's voice, diligently heed the word of God. If you pay attention to it, if you if you care, if you care about God, if you care about His Word, if you're conscious, if you're conscious about God, 
in your conscience if you are aware that God exists. <laughs> Take care <laughs> and pay attention. Pay attention to him. Take notice to him. Why? And if you do heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases of Egypt. <laughs> it didn't say run to Jesus and watch him get slapped across the back and the stripes you healed. It said if you heed his voice, if you diligently hear the voice of God, if you diligently seek the voice of God, none of the diseases of Egypt will come upon if you're cautious of it, if you're made aware of it, if you're conscious that this is real, God's real, his voice is real, none of the diseases of Israel will come up, of, sorry, of Egypt will come upon you. Listen to the power of the word of God, of God's voice. This is what we've been talking about. For, this is four weeks now. We've been talking about the voice of God, our voice and the voice of God. Listen to the power of it. It stood there when Jesus, when I'm saying, I want to go to this place where the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit was there at his water baptism. The voice of God. If the people would have heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. What did they crucify him for? Because he called himself to be the son of God. That was the only witness that they could find against him that could condemn him to death. And God says, if you heed my voice, if they would have listened to God's voice, none of the diseases of Egypt would come upon them. For I am the Lord who heals you. Amazing. Uh, chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Verse 18. This, I'm just, just showing you the power of God's voice. Has God spoken to you? Have you heard the voice of God? from within, if you have an orbit who heard it, have you heard it from within? Can you understand the power that this, that's in this voice? And if you listen and you heed, if God says, go and do this, but you go and do that, maybe the diseases of Egypt will become upon you. But if you obediently obey the voice of God, none of the diseases can come upon you. So, Chapter 19, verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. <laughs> the Mount Sinai was in smoke because God descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Oh, mate, this is, I want to go here too. No, no, I want to go. <laughs> and when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Orbital voice of God. Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Amazing. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. He was obedient. Moses was obedient. Imagine, imagine the fear. Man, I get fearful just when, when things of God happen. You think, well, what's going on here? Imagine Moses. The fire come down on top of the mountain. Then the whole mountain began to shake. <laughs> they won't go back to cities because of earthquakes and because they shake. They stay out of them for months and months. This is immediately after, says Mark. No, it says me. What well, I'm just interpreting Mark. <laughs> immediately after it shaked and quaked the whole mountain, God said, Moses, it's not very secure up here, but come up. And Moses was obedient, obedient to the voice of God. Can you see some of the stuff? God's going to tell us to do that. Just, it's not going to seem secure. It's not going to seem safe. 
God, you know what me to go up there. There was just an earthquake. The whole mountain just shook. It was on fire. And now you call me to come up. But Moses heard the voice of God and he went up. He was obedient to what God had called him to do. And Moses went up there. <laughs> Job 37. Verse 4. After, this is, this is the other one. After it a voice roars, he thunders with a majestic voice, and he does not restrain them from them when his voice is heard. He doesn't restrain them when his voice is heard. It roars. This, I, was, I was the bastard's son when I first got born again in the church, and I stayed there for three and a half years before I moved down to another church take up a ministry in another <laughs> he was there one day and he was talking to people <laughs> and he said it rises on the voice of God and I went what? God yells at me <laughs> he don't talk no quiet song he yells at me, he screams at me he gets me attention he makes me pay attention, I want to hear this quiet soft voice, I've never heard it I've heard the loud voice of God yelling at me well listen then it roars this is the voice of God we're talking about here. After it, a voice roars. Rawr. Imagine the, the thunder and that out in the wilderness. The voice of God when they were there when the water baptism took place. A roar and a thunder. The voice of God. Enough to make anyone shatter and shiver. And but this is the voice of love. Of God. He thunders with his majestic voice and he does not restrain them when they hear, when, when his voice, he does not restrain them when his voice is heard. <laughs> if God says, go and do this and you hear his voice and you go and do that, there is no restraint. There is nothing restraining us from going. He does not restrain you when you obey his voice. I just read it. <laughs> and he does not restrain them when his voice is heard. So you know that I'm not making it up. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which he cannot comprehend. This is the voice of God. <laughs> the voice of God. God thunders marvelously, marvelously with his voice. Thunders, not a quiet voice, but he thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which cannot be comprehended with his voice. God does, well, he created the whole world except for flesh. He created that out of dust. But everything else we see in this world was the voice of God. God said, let there be light. What happened? There was light. God said, separate the water from the sky. And what happened? We have the ocean and the water and we have the sky. God said, I'll put one star at night to rule night and one star to rule the day. Sun and moon, they're there in a place and they're still there. To this day, and they're still doing the same job that God put them there to do 6,000 years ago. The exact same thing they're still doing. Look at the power of this voice. <laughs> God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things. We cannot comprehend what he does. What his voice says he's going to do, we can't comprehend that. Who comprehended that God said to Peter, kill and eat? from a sheet that came down from him. Who could comprehend that me as a Gentile today can be filled with the Holy Spirit and be water baptised because of that sheet of unclean animals that were coming down from him? We can't comprehend the voice of God. We can't comprehend that. If God speaks to you, please be obedient to it. Obedient to it. Because we can't comprehend. He's not going to restrain. He's not holding back. If you walk in whatever he's told you to walk in, he's not going to restrain that. And we won't comprehend it. For he says to the snow, 
fall on the earth likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of its breath. So where do they come from? The voice of God. Snow, I want you to fall on the earth. And we look there and try to catch it in our mouth and whatever, and it starts falling. And we think, oh, this is amazing. Especially if we live in a desert. We'd be, oh, look at this snow. I've never seen nothing like it. Well, what about the New Caledonians? They just seen hail. They were, they were running around. They were, oh, mate, I've never seen this. And there were hails in New Caledonia. <coughs> they couldn't, they were amazed just at hail. Imagine if they seen snow. <laughs> Not all of them, because some of them have been the French. French snow's a lot in France. <laughs> I don't know about hail over there, but, but it doesn't hail in New Caledonia. They were amazed at hail. They were driving it, loving it. I mean, get out of it, get out of it. They're driving it. <laughs> and Debbie just it smashes windows and whatever. <laughs> Oh, I get under a car park. They just loved it. But there's one I want to show you here before I finish up. I'll do this. I'll, do, I'll, say, I'll read this Revelation one. So, Revelation 2, 6 and 7. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to ear an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So when the when the voice speaks, he take ear and hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It, it might be it's the lukewarm. There might be different churches that are happening here, but let's look at my life. Let's just begin to hear what the Spirit, I've just told you that God won't restrain it. He will not restrain whatever his voice has told me to do. He will not restrain a way for me to go and do that. He will make it possible for me to be able to go and do that. He won't hold it back. And then he says, I won't restrain it and you won't comprehend how I'm going to do it. You won't be able to work out the way I'm going to do it. You won't, you'll be amazed at how I'm going to do it. Just go and do it. I won't restrain it. Just go and do it. <laughs> he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit this morning, the Holy Spirit, is saying to the church. Walk out in what God's voice has told you to walk out in and he will not restrain what he's told you to walk in. And then you won't comprehend how he's made everything possible. You won't be able to believe how God's opened every door. He's, 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 he's opened every door. I've got, there's hundreds of testimonies from other people about this, but me and Nullowen and Lillian, I don't even know if Abigail was born back then, but Tom and Stacey probably wasn't. We were driving, and we will come from Sydney, and we we're, were driving to Young, because they had to preach in Young. And we, 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 I don't know what we were in Sydney for, but we left Sydney, and, and we, I was thinking, I'll just fuel up at Bathurst. And we got the Bathurst, and every service station in Bathurst was shut. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, I choose it and go to Cara, there might be something happening at Cara. And me and other ones are the only, me and other ones, we're the only two awake. She's about seven, Nana, or six, something like that. <coughs> and we're driving along, and, the, and it's on empty, the light's on, and it's, it's, I don't know, it's been driving for about 100 kilometres with the light on, and we make it to care, huh? and there's nothing open at care, and I'm thinking, oh no, what are we going to do? <laughs> this is about one o'clock in the morning or something, and Nana said, let's just go to Young Dad. So we drove to Young, we went from we went from outside of Bathurst, we drove all the way to Young with the red light on. And every time after that we'd get in the car and would go, we don't need fuel, do we, Dad? Yeah. <laughs> we don't need fuel, do we, Dad? <laughs> and always, we don't need fuel, do we, Dad? He witnessed that night, God showed him, we drove for about two and a half hours with the red light on, not on, not flashing, on. That's one miracle. We can't comprehend. The voice of God and all I had was little none of the edge of me on. We don't need fuel, Dad. Let's keep going. We don't need fuel. We'll be right. I yeah, wish I had his faith. And we made it all the way. Oh, <laughs> all the way. Not from Sydney. 
But I, I, need, I knew I needed fuel in Sydney. I should have fueled up in Sydney. But I said, I'll do it in Bath. Nothing over there in Bath. It's just one of the little things that we can't comprehend about God. How does he do that? The mechanics of this world says, that car can't run without fuel. But God says, trust me. Just trust me. <laughs> heed my voice. Diligently heed. Don't comprehend it. No, no. This covetousness, just consciousness. Be aware and conscious of what my voice is saying to you. And don't try to work it out. Just run with what it's saying and you will have nothing restrained. And you won't comprehend how I'm going to do this before your eyes. You won't comprehend it, but it's going to happen before your eyes. Why? Because God wants us to love him and worship him that little bit extra. He wants us to go another mile or another step or another metre in our elevation of our let's worship God. Why? Because Jesus had to grow in spirit and we have to grow in spirit. If it's good enough that Jesus had to eat taught in the synagogues when he was 12 years old. <laughs> I was teaching people how to pack cones in bongs when I was 12 year old. How to grow crops. Or not crops, plants. That was me. And he's teaching in the synagogues, but he still had to grow in spirit. Therefore, I have to grow. And God's going to do these things. We listen to his voice. We won't comprehend what he has for us. But he wants us to grow. He wants us to be more and more like him. This is the one, Deuteronomy. I like this. Deuteronomy 5. Verse 23. So it was when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, that you came <coughs> near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Surely the Lord our God has shown his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. You listen to this. We have seen this day that God speaks with man, yet he still lives. Mate, oh, well, what? We are so privileged. If we hear the voice of God, if we hear God speak to us from within or somehow, we hear the voice of God, that's not something that we can just feel, oh, that's just a, a privilege or, you know, that's just something that happens. Back in these days, mate, we're thinking if we hear the voice of God, we're lucky to be still alive. I just read it. Yet he still lives. Man hears the voice of God, yet he still lives. What reverence! For God, imagine the reverence you'd have if you're in church and someone heard the word of God and disobeyed it and they dropped dead. You'd be thinking, I'm not disobeying God ever again. Everything he ever speaks to me, I'm going to do. Because if you hear his voice and you don't obey it, you drop dead. Well, what about if you're in worship and someone hears from God and down they go? Because they heard the voice of God, people drop dead. I just read it. And we are still alive. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. Too much word of the God, we shall die. This is, the, this is, this is what they see back in them days. How privileged are we? We're not privileged. It's an honour. It's an honour. To be able to sit here today and hear the voice of God and still be alive. How powerful is that word? That powerful that it won't restrain anything from opening any door for us to go through or whatever that has to be done. It won't restrain it if we're obedient to it. We won't comprehend what that word will do that voice will do 
in our lives, what it can do for us, the doors that can be opened, the things that can move. I've got a cousin, Beth. This is what you want to pray in. I, I've asked her already. But she goes around and she gives people driver's licences. She doesn't give them to them. She does a five or six week course, but she doesn't come into Queensland. I tried to get her up here. I said, other people, mate, you get up here. Other people I can put straight. You walk away with your driver's licence at the end of it. Drive in the car at the end of it. Pray that God will move mountains so that she can open doors up for her to come up here, Beth. She'll get you your licence. She told me, if I send you down to her next course, then if I ring her up and said, you can go and live in the town that she was at, she'd put you through as a New South Wales person. She told me to send Abigail down there. <laughs> the next one I do, send Abigail down, but Abigail's got this job, she can't go now. But, but this is the thing that God can do. If you've heard the voice of God, he's not going to restrain it if you obediently obey He's not going to restrain that voice. You're going to get your driver's license. God's going to open every door in heaven and earth. He's going to open every door to your obedience. He's not going to restrain one thing. He's going to open every door and you won't be able to comprehend the doors that he's going to open up. This is the power of the voice of God. This is the power of the voice of God that men thought that they were lucky to be still alive because God spoke it to me. We're lucky that the voice hasn't made us die. <coughs> and here we are, freely hearing from the voice of God every minute of the day, taking it all for granted. Thinking, I'll do that later. I'll put that on the shelf. Oh, was that the devil or was that God? Taking none of it seriously. Not confident in God, not conscious of God, not aware and fully aware of God's voice. Hearing it and saying, oh no, that's not God, that's just my thoughts. And we just push it away, push it away and never ever worry about coming back to it again. And then some mug comes along and tells you, you're great, you're going to do this and that and you're going to get rich and you run after the mug because it feels good going to make me look good and poor old God's voice that people drop down dead from is put over on the closet over there and he's restraining everything that's going on in your life because he doesn't want you to listen to that voice he wants you to listen to his that he won't restrain or hold nothing back he'll open every door on earth every door in heaven will be opened for whatever God wants you in your life that he's spoken it will come about I was a street boy, mate, I tell you, I was a wild young fella. <laughs> had no, nothing, no self-discipline, had no, nothing, no respect or nothing. And God spoke to me. <laughs> he spoke to me in 2001, I think I was. And God said, you'll be feeding people, you'll be doing this, you'll be doing that. You'll have your own little hub, you'll have your own church, you'll come out of it and everything. And I'm going, What? And then God puts the desire in your heart, inside, and you start doing what God wants you to do. And you start walking in the direction, and every door opens up. Every door. A man that couldn't even read when he was 17, done three years Bible college. Couldn't even read when he was 17, done three years Bible college, and passed. And passed. God will not restrain nothing as long as we're obedient to what he's called us to do. He won't hold back nothing. And along the way, we won't comprehend, I can't believe, the things that God's done for me. Along the way, just in me studies, I didn't even know how to use a computer. One bloke said, you've got to learn because it's so easy to submit your things. I used to hand me the things in... Bible college written out in my handwriting on a piece of paper with pen. And this bloke said, you've got to learn how to use a computer. I said, why? He said, because they've got a thing on there called spell check. And it'll spell all your words right. It'll get everything good for you. 
You got to learn. I didn't even know how to use a computer when I started Bible college. But God, He taught me. You won't comprehend. You won't comprehend the doors that He'll open up and that He will do for you. I've got a job now where I use a computer every single day of my life. I didn't even know how to use one. This is what God can do. He'll open up many doors. Many, many doors. We won't comprehend what he's able to do as long as we're obedient to his word. Obedient. God said to me, I'll tell you another one. I was still up truck driving with this truck driver. We left Army Bay and I met Lily. And I said to him, on the way, because we're two up driving so we could drive 24 hours Christmas Eve so we could be home Christmas Day. About a 17 hour trip. I said to him, I think I'm going to ask for the barrier. And he just met the woman, eh? About four or five days before that. I said to him, I think I'm going to ask for the barrier. And he went, what? And I said, no, nah, I think I'm going to ask for the barrier. He said, you can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, because you've only just met her. And I said, well, think about it. If I ask her to marry me and she says no, well, I'm not going to lose out, am I? I'm just going to know to move on. Move on and find another wife. Let God bring another one. Or if she says yes, we can build the relationship and get married one day. And he said, you can't do that. All the way home, I told him, I'm going to do it. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. So I went home and I fasted for three days. And God said, yeah, do it. And I've done it, look, 24 years later. Because I was obedient to the voice of God, we've got to go through what God tells us to do. We've got to be obedient. And then she had, Lily had to be obedient on the other side of the channel too. She had to be obedient. We didn't get married five days later. We took a long time. You've got to wait a month to even. No, it was longer than a month. It was a year. She was in New Caledonia and didn't know English. I was in Australia and didn't know French. So how does God bring two people together that don't even speak the same language? You won't comprehend what he will do for you. These are just a couple of little testimonies. Of, you can't comprehend what God can do, but you've got to be obedient. And I had the voice there telling me, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. Why can't I do that? I said, why can't I do that? Why? So I told him, it's either yes or no. And no, I just keep going on living life. Yes, I'll let God build our relationship. I listened to God's voice and not man's voice. God, I can't comprehend what God. I ring up Lily's the first time I ever ring him. I've got her uncle Adrian. He don't even speak English even. I'm trying to Lily. And they don't know her as Lily in the family and start up. <laughs> Lily, ah, uh, ah, uh, Lily, ah, uh, ah, uh, but he's talking to me and I'm, I'm Lily, you know? Your daughter, Lily. <laughs> Yeah, we never got far with that conversation. <laughs> so, so I never ever got to talk to her on the phone. I thought I'd never ring again. I thought, nah, I'm not going through that again. Not going that. <laughs> not going through that again. No, but see, we can't comprehend. So I went out and wrote a little ten, little little letter about this long because she couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak French. Didn't want to give her too much to interpret. And she wrote back about the same. That's that's how it went. We can't. You can't. And now we've been married for 24 years. You can't comprehend what God's going to do. We've just got to obey the voice. Be obedient to the voice. Amen. Now therefore, why should we die? Oh, I read that. For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. <laughs> if you hear it anymore, he's speaking. He's already told you. How many times has he told you? How many times has he said, go and do this. I'll be, I'll be with you. You are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Go and do this. How many times has he been saying, if God speaks to me anymore, I'm just going to die. He's going to get sick of me. <laughs> How thick are you? I said to God once, I said, God, I've always 
my mates and my cousins and my brothers and I was always there. Just tell them about it. When I first got saved, radical, come out of that coma and everything, spinal injuries, just tell them radically about Jesus. And I said, I was there one day and God said, I said, God, how thick are they? How hard is this message? How thick are they, God? And God said, about as thick as what you were. <laughs> I went, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, because I was thick, I was stubborn. I didn't want to know nothing about God. I didn't want to know about the word of God. And that gave me a little bit of compromise that day, a little bit of understanding. That's how they are too. Do it with love. And from that day when God said about as thick as what you were, from that day my whole way of evangelising the people has changed. I've kind of more, more um, what do you call it, I can tolerate more now. I don't walk around frustrated thinking how thick are they because I know how thick I was. God had to point that out. That's things, little things like that. God, he doesn't speak always green hills, great valleys or whatever. He does speak little things like that that can change and give us spiritual growth too. But we have to be obedient to that voice. We have to be obedient to it. So what about it? So it was when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness and you said, surely the Lord your God has shown as his glory and his greatness and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire we have seen this day that God speaks with man yet he still lives how powerful is the, is that God speaks with man but he still lives how power, just think how powerful how many times has God spoke to you but you're still alive how powerful is that God speaks to man We think we just get over there, God, or move over into that seat, God. I've got a little skit I'm going to do with the kids. Move over into that chair, God. Let let Billy get in. Jump in the back seat, God. Let Billy get in. Move over, move over, move over. Get out of the car, God. Don't want to hear from you no more. Mm -hmm. How many times has God spoken to us, but we're still alive today? We still live today. These people back in them days reverenced God that much and his voice that much. If they heard him, they wondered if they were going to die. Am I still going to breathe? Am I still going to be alive? Amazing. <laughs> of course not his words are that powerful. He speaks to men and we still live. <coughs> we read in the Bible. It's not his words. He's given us his word. We live by his word. That's our spiritual growth. That's our, that's our everything, his word. We live, I suppose we do die when you think about it. We do die. We're to die in the flesh and to live spiritually out of that. But it's his voice. When, he, when we let his voice come, it's like a roaring lion. It's like a thunder. Me and my mate were, were, were walking home one day from his place, I think from my place or my place to his place. And we went under, it was rain and really heavy rain and probably hail or something. And we ran under a bridge to get out of the rain because it was that heavy. And we're sitting there under this little bridge. I know exactly the spot. I can, I can see the spot right now. And we're sitting there, we're waiting, having a yarn to each other and that. We're about 14 or something like that. And we're sitting there, and this great big, oh no, that didn't. And this light had come down and we looked over about 10 metres beside us. And this light had hit this steel star fence post. And lightning went out everywhere. And we're just sitting there watching that, thinking that's okay. But immediately after that, seconds after that, this thunder came back. There was this great, mighty roar of thunder. He went that way to his place, and I went that way to my place, mate. He's scared as it was that loud. Well, that's the voice of God. That's the voice of God. That's how loud it is. But we want to ignore it. We want to. Was that God? Was that me or was that God? God's voice is clear and it's plain. And it's loud and it roars like a lion. A lion roars pretty loud too. They reckon if, you, if you're in the jungle and you hear a lion roaring in the jungle, mate, it echoes. It's that loud. So it roars pretty loud too. And thunder's pretty loud. So God hasn't got a still soft voice. He's got a loud voice. And he wants our attention. And he 
wants us to be obedient to him. Because when we are obedient, he doesn't shut any doors. He doesn't restrain nothing. He opens the whole lot up and we can go forth <coughs> to whatever he's called us and told us we can do without any restriction. It is an honour that we are still even alive when he speaks to us. Time to stop playing with God, with the word of God, his voice. It's an honour that we're still alive when he speaks. It's time to stop playing with it, eh? Time to move on. It's time to move on. Time to get real with God. Listen to his voice when he's speaking.